and we are gonna be live. Welcome back to Brick's Cat Unplugged, season two, episode 11, and today's topic is Blade Debugging Lisp with Steve Johnson, and I think he's above me or next to me, not too sure, but with that, my name is Matt Olding, and I have two of my colleagues with me and along with Steve. So, Vince, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Vince Amon with the uh, sales team at Brixis, and I do a little technical on the side. I'm Heidi Hewitt, uh, the product owner for BricsCAD at Brixis. Yay. And, uh, and Steve, can you introduce yourself real fast? Just a short little brief about you. I'm... Yeah, I do the uh, the blog Nauseam blog. People probably know me from that. I've written for Catalyst. I've uh, my business uh, Cad Nauseam has uh, just had its twenty nine year anniversary. Wow! Wow! So I've been doing this. I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> okay, and then folks, once again, post some comments, feedback up on Facebook or up on YouTube, and you can win a Brixis, Brix's Cad coffee mug. Okay, so with that, now Steve, we had you on before Christmas, and you introduced us to Blade, you know, BricsCAD Lisp Advanced Development Environment, and that's a mouthful, okay? You actually had a, uh, um, you know, in, in say, or I'll say on the wording and everything, because you are a saber master down in Australia, if I remember right, uh, and for, for fencing, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, but one of the things that uh, today we're going to talk about is about debugging Lisp. And, uh, and, and also, too, next week we're having you on, and you're going to go over creating dialog boxes using Blade and, and Lisp and everything like that. So with that, uh, Vince, Heidi, do you, you know, for, for, uh, for Steve, for continuing on today, uh, do you guys have any comments or anything about moving on? Vince, I think you might have some. Well, no, I'm just really excited to have Steve back because, you know, Blade is is really, it's where this, you know, if you've been using another program uh, to do CAD and Lisp development, you've probably been hoping for some updates. This is like 10 years <laughs> after that, right? It's so, uh, I, I very much enjoyed this environment. It's uh, It's much more efficient and Definitely, uh, I think maybe next week or uh, at another session we'll talk about you know some examples of things. But there's definitely stuff that uh, if you haven't seen Blade, you have to check it out if you do any Lisp development at all. I agree, definitely agree. Well, with that, Steve, I know we got a lot of things to cover today. So can we jump into? You want to share your screen and get into the different kinds of of loads and how you would start a debugging session using Blade. Sure. Okay, let's go. And um, just waiting to share my screen there. There okay. you go. Okay, that's the Utah teapot. Some of you will be uh, familiar with what uh, what that means. And um, well, so before I get into um, actually debugging, uh, I want to introduce a, a couple of things that, uh, about it. Probably the most confusing thing about debugging using Blade is understanding whether or not you're in a debugging session. So first I want to show you some of the more traditional ways of loading and running Lisp as not a debugging session, and then we'll get on to properly debugging. So uh, as usual, there's many ways of doing the same thing, so I'm going to show you uh, some of these, these ways. So let's uh, just have a look in Explorer here. I've got a file called uh, sesame.lisp. If I look at that in, in Notepad, it's just got a, uh, a few commands in here. There's BERT command and the count command and cookie monster count and so on. So if I want to add those commands uh, to, to BricsCAD, uh, there's lots of different ways of doing it. Now, the, the uh, oldest, uh, most traditional way of, of doing it is simply at the uh, command prompt here, you, you would uh, paste uh, that syntax in there with the load function and the and the name and that the would load Sesame it in file has been loaded. so I've uh, set that up so it, it, it talks to you when it when it loads of course if you do this more than once it's going to get really annoying but uh, just for the purposes of, of uh, showing you how things work so that's one way of doing it uh, you can put that load sesame in another list file uh, any file so that when one loads it loads another one and so on you can nest that as many levels deep as you like uh, 
more typically you would want those commands available to you automatically without having to manually do anything uh, and that's when you use uh, the um, automatic loading uh, files they have special names so uh, in BricsCAD the the one that if this file on underscore start dot lisp exists within your search path then that will automatically be loaded and within that one you could put your own load functions in that load sesame and and lots of other things uh, and this was actually discussed on the uh, robert green's facebook um cab managers page today in fact yeah, how to do yeah. so, so if you came here from there uh, this is what you do and if you're an autocad user uh, then the equivalent of that is acad.lisp uh, so the it just has a different name in BricsCAD, but it does the same thing. And equivalent to acad.doc.lisp, we have the on.doc.load.lisp. Uh, so <clears throat> they have different names, uh, but uh, that doesn't really matter. If you, uh, if you have a, a dual environment with both AutoCAD and, and BricsCAD, it actually makes things easier to, to manage having, to having the different names there. So that's uh, another way of doing it. Uh, if you have a, uh, a customization file, like a partial customization file, you might have one called kermit.cui or cuix. Um, if you have another file called kermit.mnl, uh, that's just a, an equivalent to a .lsp <laughs> file. It just has a different name. Uh, but that could have its own load function in there that loads sesame.lisp and, and does the same thing. Um, and that way that when you load in your partial menu, your partial CUI with a ribbon or toolbar, as soon as you hit the button, the command is going to be there without the user having to, to do anything. Uh, another way of doing it is to use the, the app load command. There's our, our app load command. And uh, in this case, I already have a a, uh, function, a, uh, <clears throat> a, a Lisp file in here that gets loaded automatically and you can determine whether or not you want to auto load that at, at startup uh, or you can, uh, you can explicitly load it at, at this stage. Uh, and this works for lots of other uh, kinds of executables, not just Lisp. So you can use this for ARX and BRX uh, and lots of other things. That's good and to know. The other thing you can do, of course, is you can just drag and drop it. So here's an Explorer window here. I'm just going to drag and drop it onto the, uh, the drawing area. The sesame.lisp file has been loaded. <laughs> so so, so once, funny. It, once it's loaded, then the commands that are defined <laughs> in sesame.lisp uh, will actually work. So I've got a BERT command, for example. Yes. I do mind. And, and so on. So um, that's the traditional way of, uh, of, of doing, doing that. Uh, and uh, with, uh, with this in Explorer, you can, in fact, select a whole bunch of them in the typical Windows way and click and drag them and, and load them at, at all at once. So that's some of the ways that you can um, load your, your Lisp. Not debugging, but that's some of the ways. Excuse I think me. we also talked about this the other day. You can use you can use scripts. Some people use scripts to do loading. Scripts work in here just as well, uh, same as they would in in other systems. Yeah, yeah, quite right. Um, yeah, and among other methods, lots of different ways of of doing it. Um, so yeah, you can have in fact have a startup script. So when you double click on your your Windows icon, it automatically starts the script, the script loads the Lisp, and so on. L lots of different ways of doing it. Yeah, so Steve, that's, you know, so that's some of the old stuff. What's, what about some of the new stuff with using Blade? Okay, so you can get a Blade um, using the, uh, the Blade command, and just BL is, a, is enough. Um, or you can use a VL IDE. So that's still, that's um, if still. you uh, if that's stuck in your, <laughs> if that's stuck in your memory you, you can use the same command just uh, just but but it's really cool blade and uh, we introduced this last time and, and showed everybody uh, the different areas of the screen and what they 
what they do. Um, but what I want to show you here is just other ways of loading this time from within Blade. So I've got several files uh, open here. You can see the, uh, the tabs along the, the top here, and you can also see them on the, on the side here. Uh, so they're opened in the editor. That doesn't mean they've been loaded into BricsCAD. They're just opened in the editor. <clears throat> um, so you'd have to load it explicitly. And, and one way of doing that uh, is uh, by picking this button here, which loads the file in BricsCAD. The sesame.lisk file has been loaded. Okay, I, are you annoyed by that, that are you annoyed by that one yet? No, um, I want it. I want it. <laughs> it cracks me up. <laughs> Blade, making CAD fun again. Yeah. Okay. So another way is to uh, drag and drop uh, from, from this list of files here. You, just, you can drag and drop from there. This is the same as the Explorer. .list file has been loaded. Um, let's go back into Blade. <clears throat> uh, you can right click. And there's an option here in the menu for doing it. The sesame.list file has been loaded. Or as it says uh, here, there is a, a, a keystroke combination, uh, alt Control c uh, which, which does the same thing. And, um, yeah. I detect a small Australian accent in that robo voice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. That's a, that's a standard <laughs> Windows, uh, Windows thing. Uh, I think it's kept the truth. The truth, mate. <laughs> it's something a bit exaggerated. So, <laughs> all right. So you can, of course, uh, um, change this uh, this keystroke uh, combination here from version 19 of BricsCAD on. You can change pretty much all of the keystroke combinations in the preferences dialog box. So, uh, all of these methods allow you to load your code so it it will run. Um, as, as we've uh, already uh, demonstrated. So what they don't do is run your code in a debugging session. So even the methods I've shown you here within Blade are just loading it into BricsCAD. So you can't step through or use breakpoints or, or anything like that. It's not real debugging. Uh, so what I want to do now is, is show you a, um, an example. So I have an uh, example uh, file here, debugging example. And uh, what we're going to do is, uh, is we're going to load and run this example. And this has a deliberate bug in it. Um, <clears throat> so over here, we've got the open files. If I switch to the resources tab, you'll see there's a list of commands. That's a pretty short list. It's only got one command that's been, uh, been added uh, in here. Uh, but uh, you can right click on that and run the command. So you don't have to go into BricsCAD and start and type the example one, although you can do that if you, if you want to. Uh, but let's uh, run it and see what happens. Okay, okay, so it didn't work because it hasn't, isn't actually loaded at this stage. Okay, so I've got to load it. So I can use any of the different methods to load it. I'll right click and I'll load it. So the debugging example one has has been loaded here. <clears throat> and uh, I can do it from Blade or I can type in example one here. There's, ex there's my example one command. And now we have an error, which is good because it, it's supposed to be there. Okay, this is a deliberate error. Yeah. So if I switch to the uh, VixCAD text screen, you can see, a, uh, you can see exactly what's, uh, what's gone on here. So initially, because I hadn't loaded it, I had unable to recognize the command. Then I loaded it, I ran my command, and then the command ran. Now what, what this command does is it just starts with a thousand and divides a thousand by 10, and by nine, and by eight, and there's a loop in there that goes down one at a time, dividing, and after it divides by one, what happens? it will divide by zero, which is a, a classic computer programming error uh, where you can't divide by zero because you would get infinity and computers don't deal well with infinity. So what we have here is a, uh, uh, the message that appears in, in BricsCAD. 
it, it, this is a call stack which shows you that, okay, we've loaded this function called example one. That has a function within it called show division, and it could be nested multiple levels deep, so you can see exactly where the, the errors occurred. And, uh, and then it tells us exactly what the, uh, where the expression is. So the expression is you know, divide the dividend by the divisor, and then it specifies exactly what, the, uh, what it is. So this is all standard BricsCAD stuff. This has been around for years and years. Um, and, um, but that's not debugging. It's not, but it's helpful. That's very helpful, actually, when that happens, because <laughs> at least it starts you on the right path. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh, it's much more useful information than, the, than you might get with uh, another um, CAD another application. Care package. <laughs> another CAD application. It's, it, it's a bit more useful than that. But anyway, so it's had, it, had that for, for years, uh, but now we've got Blade, and that's a, that's a whole new world. So having shown you what's not a debugging session, I want to show you an actual debugging session here so you can see how that works. So I'm just going to switch back to, uh, to Blade here. And I've got another debugging example here. And um, <clears throat> I want to show you this as a, as a debugging session so you can see the difference. So uh, we've, we've opened this uh, file. It's in the editor. Uh, the commands in here have been... Uh, loaded into the editor, but not loaded into Bricks CAD. So if I, at this stage, use my example to command, Bricks CAD's got no idea what that is because that hasn't even been loaded at this stage. All right. So what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, use the um, play button here. Okay, and this will start the debug session. This button here is the key to everything. So if I pick this, it now prepares the debugging session. This debugging floating toolbar here appears. So at this stage, we're not actually debugging. The file is not loaded. We're just ready to go. Uh, and there's still no example two command. We're just ready to go with our debugging session. So what I'm going to do now is actually load the, the button here. This, this load, uh, load the list file into BricsCAD within the debug uh, toolbar uh, actually does the useful stuff. Now, notice there's an auto break uh, checkbox here. I'll explain that one later, but just notice for now that that's, that's been turned on. So I'm just going to pick this loading button. So you'll see a few things have, have happened. So uh, in this uh, um, debug tab over here, it, it says that this is a debug enabled file. Um, we have a, a call stack here that, uh, that shows us the, where we are in, in the code. So what that, what's happened at the moment is it's loading the code and there's a, a piece of code here that's loose, that's not within a function, and so they're getting executed at the time we load the file, uh, which is how I got the uh, Sesame to speak to us. So I, I put a function that wasn't within a, uh, a function, I, uh, I placed it at this top level here. So as it's being loaded, you're actually debugging it at this stage without, without running a function. So I'm just gonna uh, just let that go i press the, uh, the play button here again and it, and it will carry on. So now it, it has gone through and successfully loaded and the example to command exists. So I can run that. <clears throat> so now it's within a debug session and it's running the code. And you'll see several things have, have happened here. First of all, you'll see that there's a, a little yellow arrow here in the in the margin that shows you where we have stopped. We're not actually continuing to run the code. We've actually yeah, stopped it at this point. Uh, you can see that the down here within the call stack, it's uh, it also showed you where we've stopped. And um, 
just bear with me a second. All right, and there's some stuff over here within the locals tab, so which we'll discuss later. So um, something you might notice here is that Blade is automatically switching tabs around for you when you do stuff. Uh, there's lots of different tabs here, but instead of you having to constantly go picking around to, to find what you want, it puts the, uh, the focus on the tab that is most useful at that time. So uh, Torsten Moses, who's uh, developed this, has put a lot of thought into making it efficient. So in normal circumstances, you don't need to go clicking around all over the place. It usually shows you the stuff that you, you want to see. That's nice. So back to the, yeah, it, it is nice. There's a lot of really nice stuff. He has put a lot of thought into this. So the, um, you may ask, why has it stopped at this point? Well, this is the first bit of actual useful code here within that's defined within example two that we're, we're running. So within here, it's defined a couple of functions and now it's actually doing something. It's setting the, uh, the value of some variables. And it stopped at that point because of this auto break feature here. So I had that turned on and that's why we were stopped now. So if I didn't have that turned on when I loaded it, it would have just gone ahead and run without stopping at this point. So, um, yeah, so it, it just stops at the first point where, it, where it's doing something. So, on to the local. So, this uh, here has shown you a list of the, uh, the local variables that are defined uh, within the function that we're, we're currently in. So, here's I've defined a couple of local functions and that they're in there, you can see those are red. And I've also defined these local variables and they are also defined here. So they're nil at the moment, there's nothing happened to them at, at this stage. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and actually do a bit of debugging and see what happens. So having stopped here, we can now continue on through the code uh, and there's various buttons here. There's a single step and step over, step into and step out, the traditional uh, debugging uh, buttons here. Uh, there's also one that run to cursor that I really like. And what that allows you to do is you place your cursor anywhere in the code, hit that button, and then it just goes to that point. Oh, that's and nice. That saves you having to go step, 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 and, and that saves saves a lot of time. So if I click in, in this line here, I can click anywhere, it doesn't matter where on the line I click, and then hit this button here, then it runs and carries on. And you can see where the yellow arrow is showing you where the, the point is. And uh, it's if we now have a look at the, um, at the locals list, we can see that these values have, have changed here. So we've got um, uh, loc one is set to be and, and, and so on. So it's, um, as you run the code, these variables will, will uh, within the locals thing will, will change automatically. So um, that shows you what, what's going on there. Excuse me, <clears throat> running out of voice here. Uh, need some lubricant. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, um, yeah, when they when they um, these values change, they're shown as red. So that helps you see at a glance what's changed and and what hasn't. Now, something else you'll notice within this locals tab here is over on the right here, we have a, a breakpoint um, column and we can turn on a checkbox in each of these. So we have a loc3 checkbox here. So I'll just turn that, hit that there. Uh, and now I'll just um, continue to, to let the, the, uh, the code run and we'll see what happens. So I'll just hit the continue button here. Okay, and it stopped again. Now the reason it stopped this time is because this value of this variable has changed. So this allows you to do, typically when you're debugging, there's some variable that's, that's messed up. 
it's got the wrong value in it for, for whatever reason. And you want to see what happens when it changes. So this method allows you to find out, to get the code to stop at the point where it's going to modify that, that particular value. I, so, you know, um, I, Steve, I really like the fact that all these variables are down in this area where we can see that, but I also noticed that there's multiple watch tabs here, um, and there's three of them, so can, can you explain that? Yeah, sure. So um, if you're used to the VLIDE, there's this, this one watch window, and uh, this is equivalent to, to three of those, and you may think, well, why do you need them if you've got this stuff happening automatically for you. Well, there are certain circumstances where you, you might need to use these the, the watch windows explicitly. And this having three of them uh, is just handy. You can have different combinations for running different bits of the code and so on. Very cool. So uh, the circumstances where you might need them is for variables that are not defined as local within the current function. So for example, we've got some global variables here. So I've got to glob one here as a global variable. And uh, I have some variables that are only changed within other functions as a side effect of those functions. That, that's not great programming practice, but it happens. Uh, but so where that's happening and you, you need to watch the contents of those variables, then you simply click and drag them. So I double click on that, click, drag, double click that one, click, drag. So it saves a lot of typing. Uh, and again, Torsten's put a lot of effort into making things efficient to make click and drag work in lots of places uh, within Blade. Um, so side one here, I'll just add that one there. and. I can turn on a breakpoint uh, checkbox uh, there so that when this one changes, then the code will, will, will stop again. So again, just remembering where we are, we're at this point in the code here, and I'll, I'll just run it again. And now it's changed, now it's stopped because side one has changed, which I just turned on. So you can see you can do this dynamically while you're in the middle of a debugging session. You can add stuff in, you can add, add your own um, variable based breakpoints without any explicit breakpoints uh, added, added in there. So um, that, that's awesome. I, I, cause I traditionally what I would do is put little comments either printing uh, a comment to, to know where I was or ha actually have to code in some explicit breakpoints. Uh, but using just what you showed there, plus the uh, auto break, that like does all that without having to put the explicit code in. Uh, that, I think that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. And of course, you do have your traditional breakpoints as, as well. You can just uh, add in at any point in, in the code. So it, it's all there, but this is really handy. And something really nice is that it, it's not just an on-off here. It is possible to put expressions in here. So it only stops when variables are set to certain values and, and so on. We may cover that in, in some later um, uh, session. Uh, okay, so, all right, so, um, Okay, debugging. What's the point of debugging if you don't have any bugs? So in this particular bit of code here, um, you may notice that uh, there's, there's a, a bug. Uh, I have, have a, a function here called broken code. Um, can anybody spot the deliberate error? I think I see the problem is, is there, there's not a um, bucket system variable? <laughs> Okay, yeah, so so we were trying to set a system variable here called called the uh, bucket um, and uh, of course Heidi with her encyclopedic knowledge of, of commands and system variables has immediately uh, spotted <laughs> spotted that one. So uh, I think you could be right there. So what I'm going to do is just remember we're still in the middle of the debugging session. I'm just going to let it run and see what happens. And there we go, a list error has been detected. So it's giving us some pretty explicit instructions about what's gone on. It says set far, there's a system variable not available bucket. Oh, 
if only Brick's cat had a bucket system, <laughs> there, well, the code would have worked. Okay, so I pick OK here, and um, I'll just at, at the, it's actually stopped here before running the code, so it's preemptively stopped the code without crashing. Instead uh, of failing, which, it did it before. That's super cool. Yeah. yeah. So it's told you about the problem without, and at this stage, before it's failed, you can check your locals and, and, and any watch variables and all that sort of stuff, and you can see stuff that's going on, or you can do stuff within the Lisp console and put your own Lisp code in here to change things. All sorts of stuff you, you, can, you can do before running this next bit and watching it crash. But I'm just going to let it run and watch it crash anyway. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and let it happen. And so if we go over to um, BrickScad here and flip to the text screen, you can see what's happened. And as before, we've uh, we've run our example too. It says hello, and then it says this code is bad and should feel bad, and then it's actually crashed. And so there we have our call stack. We've got example two calling set variables, which calls broken code, very aptly named. The uh, function there. It says there's an error around the expression set var bucket zero because set var, so it's all very explicit. It tells you exactly what's gone wrong with the code uh, and uh, and then we can fix it. So um, do I have time to make the change, uh, Matt? Yeah, yeah, go for it. I've got a couple of minutes. Okay, I'm, yeah. I'm, as usual, I've gone over time, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so if you have an appointment to go to, uh, you'll just have to watch the YouTube video later. <laughs> there you go. All right. So it's made it very clear what the what the problem is. So I've got to fix this. I'll I'll change this to to, to some variable that that does exist. Um, let's turn our blips on. That's a good old fashioned uh, bit of uh, history there. So. Yeah. Um, I've added a system variable that does work. I just commented out. I could do all sorts of stuff here. <clears throat> um, so as soon as I've changed the code within this debugging session, you can see several things have happened. And, and one of them is that down here within the debug files thing, it says debugging example 2.lisp changed reload need, needed. So it's telling you what's going on and what you need to do. So That's you can good. just... It, yeah, it, it, it's really good. So um, if I just go ahead and run it, it tells me that I need to save my changes. So it, again, it, it's being helpful all the time. It's saying, would you like to save your file? Now, not compulsory, but OK, yeah, I'm going to save my changes. I go ahead and go OK. Uh, and I'll continue to run it. and. Um, uh, and now, if I run my example two command, it'll stop in a couple of places as before, but I'll just let it run through. And there it is. And the code is, has completed without having any errors uh, occur. It still says it's bad and should feel bad, so I, I should probably change that. Um, so again, if you need to edit the code, if we have a look at debug files, it automatically changes to red here. It shows you what's going on. And um, yeah, so you can just go ahead and do it. It automatically saves it for you. You run it and I'll run it from here this time, example two, run it. Okay, and there we go. Our, our modifications have, have taken effect. Uh, this code is good and should feel good. So, <laughs> Life is good. Yeah, that's very nice. We'll see. Okay, so sorry if I flashed through that last bit uh, a bit quickly. You'll have to put the... Uh, Slow it down in YouTube and see exactly what, which buttons I click there, but uh, but that's uh, that's uh, pretty much debugging in Blade in a nutshell. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. That's that's wow, Steve. Lots of great information there and everything, but yeah, that was wonderful. Um, 
I haven't done any list programming in, in years, but that makes me want to jump back in and do some more. I know. Cool. Yeah, it's been, it's bold. I keep on bringing forward my simple little shortcut commands and they still work. You know, it's just like from 10 years ago, it's just like, just bring it forward and in, inside of BrickScan. It's just like, wow, it's still working. But yeah. Yeah. So folks, uh, we went a little long again, but uh, I just want to say thank you for joining us. And Heidi, what, what, do, you, what do we want people to do? Definitely mm -hmm. like us on Facebook and YouTube. Yep. And and LinkedIn. And and also through LinkedIn. Hey, Steve, can I have the share window? I just want to, we have some uh, events yeah. coming up. Go there for it. Go. And I'm just going to share my screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll be down in your neck of the woods. Well, sort of, Steve. <laughs> Hopefully, you and I will we'll get together there in um, Brisbane as Matt pulls that up. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, so so upcoming events, folks. Next week here on, on Unplugged, uh, we're going to have Steve again, but he's going to go over creating dialogue boxes uh, using Blade. And then uh, other events, so Heidi will be doing on the, uh, the 19th of this month, uh, CAD work seminar, but she'll be covering, Heidi, you're going to be going over uh, BricsCAD, basically. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then, uh, and then, like Heidi was saying, down March 19th down in uh, Australia is the BricsCAD uh, convention that's going to go on down there. And, uh, and maybe, Heidi, we might be able to, you know, beam in or, you know, uh, yeah. and get a little update what's going on. That would be fun. We to definitely do. plan on that. That will be fun. Yeah. yeah. Live from Brisbane. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, with that, Steve, I just want to say thank you for staying up late and joining us and, uh, and everything. And I hope your weather uh, turns out to be better tomorrow. It sounds like you have some thunderstorms going on down there. And, I think it's okay now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, with that, we're going to say goodbye. And folks, we'll see you next week with more with Steve. Bye. Okay. Bye, bye. Yay. Bye. Okay, you guys.